Professor Tony Bennett, in the last decades you have produced an impressive and highly influential body of work focusing on a variety of subjects and concepts in the fields of uh, aesthetics, literary theory, cultural studies, cultural sociology or museum studies. My first question would be, could you briefly outline the trajectory uh, that led you from the publication of, say, Culture, a Reformist Science in 1998 to your more recent work on the genealogy of the concept of culture as a whole way of life and your recent, more recent even, Making Culture Changing Society? Mm, yeah, well, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, the book Cultural Reform as Science was a book I wrote uh, as a calculated intervention into debates in cultural studies at a time when I was becoming involved in cultural policy studies. And cultural policy studies was for me an institutional and uh, it was an institutional project. I was involved in setting up at Griffith University an institute for cultural policy studies together with colleagues there. But I wanted to engage with questions of cultural policy at a theoretical level as well as at a, a practical level. Uh, and as a part of that, I wanted to think about how to theorize the relationships between the concept of culture and processes of governance. And this had not been prior to that time a, a, sustained, a, matter, a matter for any sustained attention within cultural studies. By and large, the kinds of concepts of culture that have been focused on within the traditions of cultural studies have been subcultural analysis, for example, or it had been questions of working class culture culture as a way of life, something that I'll come back to. But I don't think anyone would have thought particularly how to think about the concept of culture as itself deeply implicated in processes of governance. Uh, and I understood governance as a, a broader set of issues than those of cultural policy, including questions of cultural policy, but broader ones, um, having to do with the way in which, in a phrase that George Udyssey has made famous since, culture was used as a resource mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways for shaping the conduct of populations. Um, and that's one part of the context. I had, at that point in time, uh, for some time, worked with, and in some respects against, but chief, chiefly with, the concepts of Foucault. And so I wanted to draw upon Foucault's work, and particularly his perspective of governmentality, to work through how one might begin to rethink the concept of culture from some of the more familiar ways, particularly those that have been familiar within British and American cultural studies, uh, to think about it as something that was in play in the processes of relationships between various authorities, not just governments as in the sense of the state, mm -hmm. but various, various authorities on the one hand and the conduct of different populations or sections of populations um, on the other hand. Um, so that is in a general way that the thinking that informed my work on uh, developing this book, Culture Reform as Science. In doing that, I built upon some general perspectives that I developed in an earlier book, The Birth of the Museum, and that I went on to develop in a subsequent book called Pasts Beyond Memory, in which I looked in some detail at the role of particular kind of epistemological authorities or cultural authorities associated with the development of ethnographic museums in the late 19th and early 20th century and the ways in which these forms of authority associated with these particular institutions in the USA, in Britain, in Australia, the, the ways in which these forms of authority were used to shape the conduct of populations in those countries in varied ways. I would like to go back a little uh, to the Foucault effect mm. uh, in cultural studies because I think that uh, your contribution to um, recuperating of the ideas of Foucault, putting them in the agenda, on the agenda again, and using the concept of governmentality, but not only that, the concept of the production of knowledge through discourse and yeah. how discourse has to do with power and how power um, has so many aspects from disciplinary power to other kinds of power. And I think that uh, your work has been very, not only very important, but seminal in the uh, production of further work by other scholars also, uh, uh, developing the, these concepts. Uh, my question is, uh, do you feel that after um, a couple of decades, uh, after you started working with the concept of governmentality and applying it to the museum and to the, the, the control of populations and so on, uh, the, the circumstances of the early 21st century or in the 
after the first decade of 21st century still apply as conditions where in fact, the, uh, the Foucaultian concept of uh, governmentality still applies, or do you have to change and, and really start a new paradigm? Uh, uh, well, no, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a need to change, and it's too late for me to start <laughs> a new paradigm <laughs> if I I've ever started a paradigm. But I think what I'd say to that is that, to the contrary, in many ways, the, uh, the kind of concepts and arguments and perspectives that I've derived from Foucault seem to me more applicable now historically than they might have been in the past. And what I mean to say by that is that the, the late 20th and early 21st century are ones in which we see the multiplication of authorities of culture. That's to say, if the perspective I derived from Foucault was to look at the ways in which various cultural knowledges, like art history, like um, anthropology, like aesthetics, have informed the ways in which, through, through cultural institutions, programs of social governance are put into effect, then... Um, what we witness in the present is the absolute multiplication of cultural authorities that are invested in, are involved in, are committed to various ways of seeking to shape the attributes of populations without seeming to do so directly, without intervening in a forcible or directive way. And this is because culture has proved to be a remarkably kind of like pliable, elastic force for various authorities to seek to intervene in the management of conduct, and of human affairs, of social relations, and so on, uh, but doing so through uh, the mechanisms of liberal government, as Foucault defined them. And this is something I think that has become much clearer for me than when I wrote the book Culture, a Reform of Science, through the subsequent publication of Foucault's lectures on biopolitics, mm -hmm. in which he talks about liberal government at some length, and he talks about liberal government as, in particular, something that works through the forms of freedom that it produces, that it constructs. That freedom isn't for Foucault, it, when he talks about liberal government, it's not something that's given. It's not something that people are not free standing in, in opposition okay. to the state as a coercive mechanism that um, oppresses them, which isn't to say that doesn't happen in many historical contexts, it does. But in the context of the modern forms of liberal government he's concerned with, Foucault says, no, Liberal government makes up, consumes, distributes freedom as the mechanism through which it um, resources us, helps us, equips us to shape ourselves in various ways that align our persons, our identities with governmental projects of one kind or another. And the concept of culture has really ever since its elaboration uh, by 19th century authorities from Kant through to Matthew Arnold and so on, it has developed as a resource that has a certain kind of elasticity that lends itself to various programs of liberal government in this way because it's been defined as a realm in which questions of freedom are at play. Which brings me to another question that I think is, uh, for me at least, uh, very important in the realm of uh, culture studies and cultural studies, which is the concept of class. Uh, it was so important uh, when uh, the study of culture started in a more coherent way in the middle 19th century. If, uh, if we read Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy, the, wor the work is riddled with classed barbarians, the Philistines, the populace, and those patterns, uh, so to speak, this, uh, uh, from industry, arising from industry, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy, uh, uh, continued for decades to be more or less the framework of cultural analysis uh, very often. Then uh, there was uh, this eruption in, in cultural studies that uh, Stuart Hall speaks about and other writers as well, of feminism, of uh, um, um, uh, race studies and uh, ethnical studies and so on, and also the linguistic turn, uh, the, the cultural turn and so on. And class seemed to lose some of its... Uh, um, not, any, not exactly coherence, but some of its impact. Uh, also because society changed so much that perhaps those classes traditionally uh, divided into three uh, were not operational anymore. But in your work, I seem to uh, see uh, a, a return to class as a, an important concept to be uh, included and to be operational in cultural studies. And I would very much like to hear you speak hmm. about the return of class, if a return we can uh, talk about. 
Uh, well, I don't think class has ever gone away as something important within uh, cultural studies, but certainly its, it's okay. relative importance was somewhat eclipsed by adding in, if you like, questions of gender and ethnicity, which ought always to have been there in a sense. So undoubtedly, Stuart Hall's work was crucial in um, drawing our attention to the significance of questions of race, race and ethnicity in contemporary forms of uh, cultural division, cultural contradiction, and cultural antagonism. And that was a powerful and significant uh, corrective to what had been in the first instance in the work of uh, Raymond Williams and Richard Hoggart and Edward Thompson, their, their work, immensely important, had a more one-eyed focus, a more singular focus upon questions of class and history and culture in the British context from the late 19th century or, or, or 19th century through to the 1950s and 60s. I doubt though that Stuart Hall would ever have said, and indeed I'm sure he wouldn't have said that Paying attention to questions of ethnicity uh, means that questions of class are unimportant. Or dealing with yeah. questions of gender means that these questions are unimportant. But questions of the, the issues raised by feminism and the issues raised by the focus upon um, black liberation struggles, questions of ethnicity and multiculturalism, had to be taken on board so that class could be seen in a more relative and framed perspective. But I think that the trick is always in uh, cultural and social analysis to consider how these relationships between class, gender and age for that matter too mm -hmm. uh, and ethnicity interact in complex ways. So that in, 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 in societies like uh, uh, the, the two societies that I'm most familiar with, Britain and Australia, um, it's very clear that questions of class and ethnicity intersect in all sorts of ways so that people who you know, there's a disproportionate number of people who are migrants to those countries who occupy lower socioeconomic positions and their cultures and identities are shaped by both their being people in movement, they're shaped by their ethnicities, but they're also shaped by their class position. And of course, uh, men and women from the same ethnic backgrounds uh, are often profoundly differently placed in relationship to their ethnic cultures and identities and they often occupy different class positions too. So analysis has to be open to all of these issues, I think, to grasp and engage with the complexity of the real. And in the case of Australia, if, um, if I may uh, recall uh, correctly, uh, a number of publications that uh, you, you have already produced uh, on museums and museum studies. Um, there was also the question of the ethnic, ethnic museum and, 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 and the, the, the sort of um, Foucaultian effect uh, uh, of um, producing an image and regulating an image, an ethnic image, uh, for people uh, uh, that were um, born and uh, had been, uh, um, had a uh, 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 sort of uh, Australian uh, heritage or in the United States an American heritage, not from abroad. Because uh, talking about class uh, sometimes, and you even uh, right now talked about uh, immigration and so on, and so th this kind of multi-culturalism uh, that exists. But then uh, in your work about museums, I think that that uh, uh, fact, which is a bit different, uh, uh, which has to do with uh, bringing about an image of uh, ethnicity, um, in a country like Australia mm. as something really that has to do with governmentality and the, the concepts that Foucault developed and uh, that you refreshed and renewed in your, um, in your work. I found, uh, I, I first went to live in Australia in the mid-1980s and I found that the debates that were going on in Australian museums at that time, tremendously interesting and to be honest, I'd never been interested in or read anything about museums before I went to Australia. And but your work is really yeah. an eye-opener, I think. Yeah, but I hadn't, I, I, I simply, I hadn't looked at them when I was, uh, uh, you know, until, I said until I went to Australia when I was in my mid-30s. And there were two or three things that interested me then and that still do. One was the fact that this was in the early 1980s. It was a period in which debates about an Australian history, an Australian past that would be clearly different from a British colonial mm -hmm. past and history were first beginning to take shape. So there was this, this idea about the new nationalism in Australia. It was a time when many new 
National museums were being projected or were actually being built. Uh, and there was a strong focus upon the distinctiveness, the distinct trajectories of Australian history. So you have this one, this one thing going there then, a post-national identity for Australia. And this coincides with the question, uh, uh, this coincided with what was a rapidly changing set of relations within the uh, composition of the Australian population, as from the 1980s onwards, what had been a hitherto predominant pattern of migration into Australia from first Britain and then from southern Europe was added to by new, uh, new migrants coming from East Asia in the main. So you have this conception beginning to grow in Australia from the 1970s into the 1980s of Australia as a multicultural population. This was a profound change in Australia which had been uh, up until that point governed by the white Australia policy which was to keep Australia uh, for the white population, and by and large the white population meant an Anglo-Celtic British population. And so you have developing new museums, museums of multicultural history that are dealing with Australia and its new migrant populations and how to construct an identity that's a multicultural one. But the most interesting issues, I think, and the most problematic and difficult ones around the relationships between museums and Australia have to do with their relationships to indigenous Australians, to the Aboriginal population. Um, there's a long history going back to the uh, late 19th, early 20th century of Australian museums collecting items through fieldwork, anthropological fieldwork expeditions from the Aboriginal populations of central Australia, far northern Queensland, and putting these in museums without any reference or scant reference to Aboriginal Australians themselves, collecting these in institutions to which they were never invited or consulted. Um, and a lively set of political issues began to develop in the late 1970s and the late 1980s about indigenous Australians wanting to take back, if you like, their cultural property, wanting to have it located in their own keeping places, wanting to contest the ways in which they'd been represented. And these issues really bubbled up into contentious public issues in the uh, 1988, as it was called, Bicentennial of Australia, to which the Aboriginal response was, this was to celebrate the 200 years of the settlement of Australia by the British in 1788, to which the Aboriginal response was, we've been here for 40,000 years, and 40,000 years don't make a bicentenary. <laughs> so, and these, these, issues about, these issues about museums are ones to which by, by, it's by no means Foucault has all of the answers, but his perspectives upon um, the ways in which institutions are the locus for knowledges which are involved in the governance of populations. In his case, he was interested in these in the asylum, in the case of the prison. In my case, I've been interested in these in uh, the role of cultural knowledges mm -hmm. in institutions like museums and the role that they have played in ordering and organizing the relations between populations, but also the ways in which their role in those regards has been contested uh, and often contested by other knowledges, other knowledge formations. So that within, uh, within Australia now, the position of Aboriginal populations is to insist that it's not just that there's an Aboriginal culture at issue, but that there are Aboriginal knowledges that, that are at issue, mm -hmm. and those knowledges are not the same knowledges as the curatorial knowledges associated with the history of Western museums. And Western museums had better move over and find a place for these different knowledge systems of um, a colonized people. One of the things that I... Uh, um appreciate uh, immensely in your books, uh, mostly in your books because the book has uh, uh, a length and a um, capacity for explanation that a short paper article doesn't have, uh, is the way you go back to the origins. Uh, uh, a little like Foucault, Foucault started by uh, trying to define the classical episteme, what is the, uh, the way, uh, uh, the invisible way that uh, in a way filters the thought of uh, 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 a certain epoch and changes uh, uh, in time. And you go back to the origins as well uh, when you talk about museums, 
the birth of the museum is really a very important book that all students here at the Catholic University, when they are doing uh, postgraduate That's studies in culture and society and uh, um, communication studies and so on, they, they read, if not the entire book, uh, uh, most parts of it. But uh, uh, even uh, your lecture yesterday uh, was also a lesson on uh, understanding the origins. Um, and uh, is there, I don't know, a recommendation that you would like to make for students nowadays um, connected with this need to go back to the origins, to study uh, the authors that really define the field, uh, the questioning uh, uh, material, um, even the talk, the way uh, uh, researchers and uh, scientists talk uh, to each other across borders, languages, and time uh, to build the knowledge that we have mm. uh, nowadays, and not uh, just remains on the surface of things mm. in the, you know this very interesting but ten-page article where we can find answers for I don't know uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, but really, uh, do you feel uh, uh, that it is important to recommend to go back to uh, um, the construction of? thought uh, uh, in the different areas and fields of study, which you have done immensely. Yes, no, that's a, really, that's a really interesting question, and yes, I do. And for me, questions of cultural analysis and questions of historical analysis mm -hmm. have, have been very closely related to one another. So I am, um, if I hadn't been, as it were, born a sociologist, I think I'd like to have been born a historian. There's a tremendous respect for the work that historians do. and. Uh, I've tried to translate that into my own work, which has focused quite a lot upon concepts mm -hmm. and the role of concepts in cultural thought, social thought, and the relations between the two, is if you want to have a, 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 we need to be aware that the concepts with which we deal have a history, and that whether we like it or not, they bring their history with them. And if as cultural analysts, we're going to use those concepts, we need to look at what they've been doing before, where they come from, how they've been modified on the way. So, to, um, you referred to the, my lecture yesterday, which was a lecture on the history of the concept, really, of culture as a way of life, mm -hmm. um, which has been one of the key foundational concepts of cultural studies. It was introduced in the work of Raymond Williams and has had a, a, a tremendous influence uh, on the field of cultural studies. But by and large, not exclusively so, by and large, most people within cultural studies have taken this concept uh, from the work of Raymond Williams, and it's been elaborated in different ways since then, but not many people have looked back at its longer history, uh, which is what I was doing yesterday, looking back at its longer history through the work of Edward Burnett Tyler, the late 19th century anthropologist, but more particularly looking at the way in which the concept of culture as a way of life was shaped in the history of American anthropology that ran from France Boas in the 19, 1910s through to Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead in the 1930s and the 1940s. And my interest in that is if um, very often the concept of culture as a way of life is something that's been uh, invoked as if it might be a foundation for a concept of culture that's always oppositional. And that's fine, sometimes it is, but its history shows that it's been deeply implicated in processes of governance mm -hmm. of populations. Uh, it's very closely associated with the development of assimilationist policies in the context of American multiculturalism. So this isn't to say that our use of the concept in the present has to be tied by its uses in the past, but you do need to know what it's been doing if you're going to handle it intelligently. And do you think that um, the study of uh, structural anthropology would be also productive uh, for the study of uh, culture as uh, a way of life, or more for the study of patterns of culture, more like... Uh, uh, because uh, uh, Ruth Benedict is very much uh, into the patterns of culture, but so is Levi Strauss uh, uh, in, in, in a somewhat different way. Um, would you say that they belong to the same family of uh, anthropologists, or there are distinctions that um, one has to respect and uh, probably not mix uh, one with the other? Uh, look, it's a very interesting question, and I haven't thought about it deeply. I mean, they come from, they really come from different intellectual traditions, yeah, don't they? Do. I mean, so that uh, Ruth Benedict's work is shaped by her engagement with 
uh, by her engagement with Boas, by her engagement with uh, fieldwork studies of uh, the uh, you know Native Americans. Um, whereas Claude Levi Strauss's work is shaped by his critical engagement with the Stuckey Durkheim, yeah. the, the Durkheim mouse tradition, uh -huh. and by early structuralist thought. Now, certainly, structuralist thought brings a kind of like a patterning to culture. Um, but I think that it's a different sort of patterning than that that, um, than that, that Ruth Benedict uh, talked about. Uh, but he's also, so it's an interesting, I'm just uh, <laughs> wondering a little bit, it's a very interesting question. And I think that, uh, I, I certainly do think, to speak to the wider aspect of your question, is that for cultural studies, the history, the, the, the role that the concept of anthropology, excuse me, the role that the concept of culture has played within different traditions of anthropology mm -hmm. is certainly something that merits our attention uh, and our serious attention. Do you think that uh, the concept, I think that you used those words yesterday, of cultural sociology uh, is new and it contains in a way a new uh, uh, opening for further studies uh, sociology uh, reviewed, revised, renewed through the concept of culture. Um, and this is uh, really a productive way uh, for thinking uh, in the future, for the future of cultural studies or studies of culture. Yeah. I think uh, the short answer um, would be yes. Um, the longer answer would be to say, well, there are different traditions of cultural sociology and it depends mm -hmm. um, uh, it doesn't depend which one one's talking about, but they do different things. What I was saying yesterday was was pointing to the ways in which uh, there's a certain birthing of the notion of cultural sociology in American sociology at round about the time of Talcott Parsons. And you can certainly trace some continuities between <laughs> Parsons' work through into the present, and I mean this in a, um, in, a, in a respectful way, through into the present in the work of American cultural sociologists like Jeffrey Alexander who draw upon both the Durkheimian tradition and they draw upon elements of Talcott Parsons in, uh, in, their concern with, um, in their concern with the interfaces between culture and society. So I don't, think that, I don't think that cultural studies as an intellectual tradition has a monopoly upon how we think about the relationships between cultural practices and social practices, how we think about the relationships between cultural relations and uh, social relations. In the context with which I'm more familiar and in which I've worked both in Britain and Australia, when one says cultural sociology, the, the kind of traditional work that's mostly referenced is that which derives from the work of Pierre Bourdieu. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't equate Pierre Bourdieu with, um, sorry, one, the, the relationships between Pierre Bourdieu and cultural studies are difficult and problematic. <laughs> He was certainly influenced by them at one point in time, and he had a very respect, respectful relationship with Raymond Williams. They knew one another. Williams had gone to speak in Paris, uh, and Williams was responsible for introducing Bourdieu's work to English readers in a number of contexts. But later on in his life, uh, Pierre Bourdieu became quite critical of cultural studies, um, seeing it as a bit of a populist project of a kind that he didn't want to uh, endorse or embrace. But nonetheless, his work on cultural fields, his work on cultural capital, his work on cultural consumption has had a profound influence on people working in the fields of both cultural studies and cultural sociology. Um, and uh, I think there are significant limitations with Bourdieu's work, as there are with any scholar or intellectual. But at the same time, his perspective upon the relations between culture and class have actually proved more enduring and have produced a much that more influential, mm -hmm. that distinction, yes. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have produced what is now probably the most influential tradition engaging with questions of the relations between culture and class internationally, mm -hmm. and certainly more influential than uh, the traditions of class analysis associated with British cultural studies, I would say, e including within Britain. Mm -hmm. The Bourdieu paradigm is now uh, very significantly influential. Um, even though it, it has its weaknesses, but that would take me quite a while. I can't uh, take more of your time, although I would like very much to reserve the last uh, minutes of our uh, talk uh, to any subject that you think and feel 
uh, that you would like to talk about, transmit uh, uh, a sort of reflection within the context of the Lisbon Consortium, the, con the context of this uh, uh, happening, uh, uh, this summer school. Um, is there anything that you would like to share with us uh, further um, this afternoon? Well, I've, I've, over the last couple of days, listened to lots of great papers on the part of the postgraduates and um, early postdoctoral students who, uh, early postdoctoral <laughs> fellows who've come here presenting their work from different parts of Europe uh, and learned a lot from them. Um, I guess one of the things that, um, if I were offering uh, kind of advice, I suppose, to people who might be postgraduates and so on who might be watching this, would be uh, I've noted how everyone who has wanted to kind of like work through and make reference to every possible cultural theorist under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and then, as it were, come at the end of their papers to the empirical issues that they're dealing with. And in some ways, I'd say, grapple with the empirical issues and materials. Um, and be selective in which, in which cultural theorists you want to deal with, because you can't pay tribute to them all at the same time. And eventually, you have to decide and select um, which, theoretical, which theoretical problematics you want to work within. And uh, very often the best way of doing that is you don't make an abstract decision and say, oh, I'll, I'll go for that because I fancy it. You really work out which tradition you want to work with that works best for you by identifying more clearly the empirical problems you want to grapple with. And that's what should help you decide between the theoretical traditions in which you want to work, with which you want to work more deeply. Thank you so much no, for being you. with us and for sparing your time uh, to answer those questions. Yep, thank, thank you. Thank you for your interest in my work.